This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Welcome back to uh, the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, uh, which uh, is uh, organized and uh, helped on its way by uh, Democracy at Work. And I want to urge all of you to try to and I become familiar with the democracy of work and all that it does and its struggle to try to create a more equitable, socially just uh, society and uh, that you will be able to support us uh, both in person but also financially because, uh, well, we need desperately to try to take the situation that we're now in by the, take it by the horns and make it into a radically different uh, 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 configuration. And it's on that theme that I want to reflect a little bit on uh, my life in academia. I've been in academia since 1960. So you see that I have uh, been there for 60 years. And uh, people sometimes say to me, how different is it from how it was, and there are many, many things that are really, really radically different. For example, uh, the, the number of journals that now exist is, has exploded. Uh, the number of books being written has exploded. When I was a student and I was given an essay to write, I would go and I'd find maybe two or three books that were relevant to it, but that's all there was. So there's been a, an ex explosion in the, in the quantitative knowledge and, and so on, and it's been harder and harder uh, to try to keep up. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that you realize over the years that maybe uh, 80 or 80% 80 of what you're doing uh, as an academic is you're, you're preserving knowledge. Uh, and only about uh, maybe... 20% is about uh, actually creating uh, any knowledge. Now, this preserving of knowledge is about to undergo a revolution through AI and this stuff called chat, uh, GPT or whatever it is. And, and we're likely to see uh, that knowledge preserved. For example, uh, I had uh, uh, my, my webmaster look at... Uh, is there a way in which you can get a synthesis of uh, some of the books that I've uh, written? And the answer is, oh, yes, that's very easy to do. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, the, the job of preserving knowledge is uh, less and less uh, impelling. So there are technological issues, of course, a bigger effect on, on publishing, uh, how that works, uh, um, the this, the, uh, the way in which the web is used, yeah, it becomes possible to have collaborative uh, enterprises and so on. So there are many things of that kind where you'd kind of say there's a mirror image inside of academia. Uh, in terms of everything else that's going on in society, and uh, there have been more and more attempts to sort of import the corporate model into the universities, and it doesn't fit very well, partly because uh, in corporations there's usually... Uh, uh, an end product that you uh, have in mind and that therefore the efficiency that you're looking for is the efficiency of arriving at that end product. Uh, it's very difficult to know exactly what the end product is of academic uh, work. I mean, sometimes, of course, it can lead to technologies, but these are, these are, these are the sorts of issues which surround. But there are two ways in which I think uh, there's a fundamental difference. And I, I raise this because I think in, in many respects, uh, higher education, and I think it's not only higher education, I think it's also education in general, uh, in the advanced capitalist world, is, is a, at a crisis moment uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons, and I want to, to try to uh, identify them. The first uh, reason has everything, everything to do uh, with the, the, not only the technology, but the ethos, if you like, of what the academic enterprise is supposed to be all about. For, for example, 
When I became a lecturer, I, I had my salary was extremely low, uh, very low indeed. I mean, I was very poorly paid. And uh, actually, I, you had a you know, pretty poorly paid uh, position uh, for many, if, if you like, the first, first 30 years of my, of my life. It was very rather poorly paid, even though I was going up in, in, stand, in where my status, uh, going from assistant to associate and eventually to full professor. But it was never a, a highly paid, but it was a, a secure uh, kind of uh, job. Um, and you had the idea that somehow or other the university was paying you to do things. Well, uh, now it's got around the other way, uh, and I think in many universities you find yourself in a job in which you're supposed to actually earn money for the university. And public funding has become uh, less and less, and even there it is largely targeted so that you will get public funding coming through uh, the National Institute of Health, which is targeted towards certain certain ends, uh, th that public funding is uh, often connected to corporate interests in very specific ways. And the idea that somehow or other the university is repositioning itself in such a way that its main mission is to provide the wherewithal of the ideas and the backup uh, for corporate capital and for big government. And I've been in situations where I've seen position papers about, uh, you know, the mission statements of various schools, and they all pretty much say the same thing. My own position all along has been that uh, it is the public interest that should drive what we're doing, and the public interest, of course, is not necessarily the interest that has enough money to be able to support what we're doing. Therefore, that has to come from general taxation. Well, the tendency now is to say, no, it's no longer taxation. It is either the big research foundations, uh, which have different kind of political postures, uh, some of them conservative, some of them uh, you know, reasonably progressive by, by liberal standards. Um, it's, uh, so... so the whole kind of ethos of what it is you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Uh, I recall, actually, in one of the universities I was working in, that uh, we, were, we were sort of singled out as being a department that was uh, in trouble. We didn't know we were in trouble because we actually we were having a very good record of uh, students coming through, getting good jobs and all the rest of it. And the dean came in, and uh, we said, well, we look at all this stuff we've done and everything. And he said, yeah, yeah, no, it's very impressive academically what you've done. But, and, and he pulled a, a dollar bill out of his pocket, and he said, I'm only interested in one thing, and it's colored green, and you don't make enough of it. And yeah, that was a, a kind of a litmus moment for me where I kind of thought, my, my God, yes, I'm here, not... not the, you know, not to sort of do things that are interesting to me and so on, and and are perhaps of, uh, I would hope, uh, are a public benefit. I, I'm I'm here to earn earn money uh, for the university. So so the so the whole kind of idea of the of the university not as a place of reflection and knowledge and creation and all the rest of it, but as a money making machine becomes, and that connects also to, if you like, the social structure inside of academia. What we see right now is, a, is in a sense, a class within a class formation. Uh, in an institution like uh, City University of New York, uh, the majority of courses are taught, taught by adjunct teachers, and the adjunct teachers get paid almost nothing. And uh, uh, then there are the, the sort of regular faculty, uh, and, and, and then there are the, 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 a, few, a few stars here and there. But uh, CUNY is not a good example of this because the real stars, if they're worth their salt, uh, are going to be spirited away to the big universities like Harvard, Yale, um, which, are, which are business corporations with very large uh, endowments. Uh, they're very very large corporations. They do a lot of the work with corporations and, 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 and of course, they're, they're, they're prestige organizations. So somebody like uh, the head of Blackstone, uh, Steve Schwartzman, can give, uh, I don't know how many, $150 million or whatever it is to MIT and to Oxford University each. 
to support uh, the humanities or something of that kind. So, so that we have a completely different ethos in terms of what the expectation is and the expectation that we can somehow or other uh, become money makers and, and money makers for the university is, 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 is one of the big shifts that, that, that has, has occurred. But, but parallel with, with that is uh, another shift, which is the, the increasing bureaucratization of the university. Now, the great thing about universities is they're very difficult to control. Um, they're, they're, there's, there's always this kind of edge where, you know, there's freedom of academic inquiry. And while it doesn't necessarily mean everything that you think it might mean, it nevertheless is there, and people do take uh, advantage of it. I have certainly taken advantage of it, um, but are always rather rather carefully, uh, because if you really upset the powers that be, you find yourself thrown out, and, and uh, you know you have to be very careful to be on the right side of them. But if you're on the right side of them, they have a great deal of leeway in terms of what it is uh, that you might be able to do. But then you kind of find that actually uh, the universities are more and more corporate and they've gone from uh, what might be called a sort of a cottage industry kind of uh, uh, basis uh, to more like a large corporation and then finally to a large corporation in a neoliberal world in, in which uh, actually uh, the internalization of competition becomes critically important. And I, and I think this is, again, something where What's going on inside of the universities is a mirror image of what is going on outside. There's great, been a great deal of centralization of capital. There's a great deal of centralization of talent and, uh, and productive capacity uh, inside of the universities. But in the, even in those big corporations, what we find is the considerable internalization of uh, competition. For example, there's a uh, very interesting book about uh, Dell computers in which there was a search for new computing and three or four labs are set up in different parts of the country within Dell and they're all in competition with, other, with each other as to who can come up with the best design for the new computational, for computational futures. So the internalization of competition becomes terribly important which changes the social relations. Uh, radically, because one of the things you start to do is you become proprietary about the kind of knowledge you control. And one of the features that uh, when I first uh, entered university was nobody was proprietary about things. They, you know, if things were, were there, they, people would talk about them and, 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 and freely communicate them. And there was a kind of freedom of uh, people would, would take from other people because, you know, they'd have conversations over coffee and, and new ideas would come up that way. Now people are very careful in talking about what they're doing and have been talking and very careful about, uh, you know, sort of uh, keeping their knowledge to themselves so that they can be identified with the knowledge because now to be identified with the knowledge is absolutely, absolutely critical. And as this becomes more and more a proprietary in the social relations, so we start to see uh, a much greater kind of uh, concern within academia uh, for what might be called um, bureaucrat bureaucratization. Now, this may seem a little odd because you've got the two tendencies side by side, which is increasing bureaucratization and at the same time increasing entrepreneurialism. And I want to insist that both of those are going on at the same time. The increasing entrepreneurialism is that you have to go out and find yourself a, a niche a niche which you could call your own and it's establish a, a proprietary uh, sort of right to the knowledge which is being produced by this kind of research, lab this research. And so there are schools of thought uh, in the humanities, there are schools of uh, uh, labs which where relationships are very hierarchical. Um, so, so, th so, so this is an entrepreneurial uh, model, but it's also connected to this increasing bureaucratization, the attempt, the attempt to sort of corral uh, the freedoms that do exist inside of academia into such a way that uh, they they can't be, uh, or, or that they, they 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 can best be consolidated in terms of, of a sort of bureaucratic rationale. 
And I, I've been in many, many universities, and, uh, and I'm talking about you know places where I've worked, but also places that I'm in communication with, and and the 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 push uh, to start to rationalize the educational structure. And the great thing is to be in a place where it's not rationalized. And if it's not rationalized, you have a great deal of freedom. The more rationalized the things become, the less freedom they have. And part of that rationalization means that somebody has to be put placed in a managerial position. So, we, we, so management has become a big, big uh, part of what these universities are about. When I began in universities, it was pretty much the case that the management of a university was a pretty haphazard kind of affair, and it was a, it was done in an amateurish kind of way. Well, it's now become professional. Uh, to be a manager of the university in, say, 1965 or something like that was not to be paid very well. But by the time you get to 1970, you start to see the payment edging upwards. Now the fact is that the managerial staff get, you know, the, the top managers, the deans and the de and the proliferation of managerial positions with a dean for this and a dean for that. Uh, we jokingly at uh, Johns Hopkins used to say of some of the deans, ah, that one is the dean for everything unimportant. Uh, so, it's, it, it, so, so, so the management structure uh, and uh, the remuneration. So the university heads now get paid very much on the basis of, uh, uh, of, of large corporations. And in fact, what we see are some of the you know, presidents of universities come from corporate capital, and they, they bring corporate management techniques and, 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 and so on into try, attempting to rationalize what the university is about. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, for example, was at Johns Hopkins. Michael Bloomberg became a board of, president of the Board of Trustees, uh, insisted that the university become more divided uh, into cost centers. And each cost center was evaluated in terms of its contribution and also its uh, liabilities. Uh, and, 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 and so that ethos started to permeate throughout to the point where every, every individual became a cost center. I became a cost center to the place. And, and when they looked at what I did, I didn't earn the university very much. It didn't matter that I had a great reputation in terms of scholarship and all that kind of thing. It didn't matter that I published a lot and all the rest of it. Oh, it didn't matter at all. Uh, what really mattered was I wasn't earning enough money for the university. And because I wasn't earning enough money, there was all this pressure to get me to leave because I was not, you know, I, was, I didn't belong in that kind of institution. In the end, the pressure got so strong that I moved out. And I moved out into the the, 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 the relative chaos of the of the CUNY CUNY system, so so you have a bureaucratization and and uh, going on. Uh, the 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 payment structure is is such that the, the the you know the big managers get get big big money. The stars at uh, which end up in the star universities and uh, CUNY is not one of them, but uh, you know Columbia, NYU, Harvard, Yale, all those kinds of things. Those, those, uh, the, the stars get paid very high. Then there are the people uh, in the middle who are being paid at, say, um, a halfway reasonable rate. And then there's the base, which is the adjunct teaching where people are, are poorly. So it's like, there's almost like a, a proletariat, which is grinding away in terms of the educational system, which is being paid almost nothing. Uh, a managerial structure where the management fees are very high, managerial salaries are very high, even higher than the, 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 the key academic salaries. And then the big academic salaries frequently go to those who can set up big institutes and, and garner money, either from the corporate sector or from the, the philanthropic sector or, or something of that kind. So you have a, a very different kind of, kind of structure. Uh, emerging, but then there's something which is which is, uh, you know, incredibly interesting to me, right now. Uh, my own experience, and immediately where where I am, is that the uh, the managerial bureaucratic side of things has become so oppressive that most university environments are not friendly environments. One of the things I used to value was relative friendliness. I mean, there was rivalries and people were always arguing about minor things and 
disputing things and so on. But the the social relations were 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 very different. Right 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 now, uh, we have administrative officers who are kind of run to the bone in terms of meeting this requirement, that requirement. We find kind of legislation about about what we have to do and what we don't have to do. Some of it imposed by the federal government, some of it by local. Uh, state apparatuses and some of it by sort of just university volition in itself. Actually, I find I find uh, there's a there's a climate of despair in large areas of university life that it's not working well. It's in bad shape. It's bureaucratized to the point where we're so busy doing the bureaucratic nonsense that we don't get time to do our own work. Uh, the, the 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 rate of uh, education that we're we're supposed to have larger classes, uh, we're supposed to work with um, more, you know, in a more integrated integrated way into into distinctive programs. Uh, there are bureaucratic requirements, so you have to have your syllabus uh, exactly organized before you do it, and you have to stick to your syllabus. I've always wanted to sort of teach in a free form way of start somewhere and then start to think about what sorts of things come out of it and then go that direction. I, I, I used to love to do that sort of thing, um, which which is kind of a bit chaotic and a bit free form. But then you would find actually some of the connections you would find would be would be quite innovative. And that's where some of your good ideas come from. Some of them, my best ideas have come out of teaching and i in a situation right now where I can teach pretty much what I want, so I'm very fortunate. But what is happening to a lot of people is that they cannot teach what they want anymore. They have to teach what they're, what they're told to teach. The syllabus is set up. AI is coming in. It's beginning to be, uh, you know, potentially oppressive in relationship to, you know, what the conditions of labor are likely to be inside of universities. We're beginning to see for the first time universities going on strike. There have been strikes in Britain. There have been strikes in uh, California. There was a strike in, in, in uh, New School in New York. Um, we're beginning to, beginning to see labor unrest. Uh, the universities are no longer uh, the kind of environment in which, uh, yeah, unionization might be okay, but there's no real pressing need for it to, to a situation where there's clearly a pressing need for it. But you, but but unionization is is also associated with increasing bureaucratization on both sides. So what we're seeing is, uh, if you like, the re reorganization of, uh, of, uh, of education uh, around these principles of uh, entrepreneurialism, increasingly bureaucratic management, and, and uh, increasing monetization in the sense that almost everything w which you do uh, has to have some sort of monetary benefit for the institution to which you are attached. So these are the sorts of things that are, go that are going on. Um, I'm not going to argue that somehow or other, once upon a time, everything was lovely inside of the universities. That's not what I'm arguing at all. It, it has always been uh, a bit chaotic and, 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 and by no means, but, uh, by, uh, by, no, by no means uh, sort of a, a totally friendly environment. It's often been a difficult uh, environment to negotiate with a good deal of prejudice and all kinds of things, and, and of course a great deal, and certainly when I started, of class privilege and male privilege in, in the university. Some of that has uh, been whittled away over the time, particularly the gender distinctions, but nevertheless, I think that, uh, so I'm not going to argue we, we need to re return back to the good old days, not at all. But what I am saying is that actually uh, you, higher education and education in general is being driven into a kind of bureaucratic nightmare uh, where the organization and the principles of, uh, of understanding are increasingly going to be dictated by conditions on the outside. And we see the extreme of this in terms of uh, these arguments as to what books can be in a school library. We will soon be in a situation where what topics we can cover in the universities are likely to be uh, also uh, regulated by bureaucratic uh, fiat. And the freedom of, uh, of inquiry uh, always was a bit tenuous in lots of uh, ways. There was always this system of what I call a repressive tolerance. That is, uh, there was a good deal of, uh, yeah, you can... You're tolerated up to a certain kind of level, 
you go beyond that level and you find yourself uh, skidding out the door. So there's always been there's always been that side side to it. So there is a progressive side, which I think is very uh, significant, but it is a, a currently a, in in dire straits. And I think I would like I would like I would suggest, and this is just partly from my own detailed experience, but also from uh, talking with with uh, my colleagues in other universities in Britain, in particular, to say that there's a sense of demoralization within the universities, a sense of despair that somehow or other things are not going well and there needs to be a radical rethink in terms of what we're doing in terms of education. I say that fearfully because that radical rethink can be taken over by the right wing and may well be taken over the right wing. So I'm very, I'm very nervous in proposing that, but something is going to break because a lot of people, I think, are leaving academia. A lot of people are saying that conditions are, of, of uh, life uh, are intolerable. They consider, consider the, the conditions of labor are becoming less and less tolerable. I, I am in a very privileged position. I acknowledge that. But uh, for many of the people involved in, in the university, this is not the case. And I think that this is something which is going to have profound effects upon uh, future society. What would be the role of higher education in, in, in a society dedicated to socialist principles and equality and justice? And, and what would that be? There were and have been attempts to sort of start to think that through from the 1970s onwards, but more and more we're finding that that is now being buried in this entrepreneurial, bureaucratic nightmare, which is increasingly taking, being take, taking over uh, the management of university structures. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production.